Welcome to College Admissions Toolbox, giving you the edge you need to get into the colleges of your dreams with your host, Steve Schwartz. That's me. We're going to split this one up into two episodes because there was so much good information that we couldn't fit it all into one. Enjoy. Welcome to College Admissions Toolbox. I'm so excited to have on the program today, Quasi Enan. Quasi, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Quasi. Now, Quasi, you have an incredible story. You've actually gained acceptance to all eight Ivy League colleges, which is something quite rare. Tell us a little bit about your journey and you know, a little bit something personal, how you, you know, where, how you got into this. Okay. So I grew up in a small suburb in Long Island. Wasn't very rich in, by any means, kind of poor. Um, and one of my closest friends, his mom was a Princeton alumni. And ever since we started hanging out, me and this friend, since I'd say the eighth grade, his mom constantly pushed for us to like drive as well as we possibly could in school because colleges, top colleges, that give you resources that you could never imagine at that age would be more than enthusiastic, overjoyed to see students like us push and get there. So that was the initial spark for the idea. And then I went through high school, you know, Ninth, 10th grade, just doing my thing. 11th grade came along. I was inspired by my teachers at that point to really love, you know, learning. And I just thought that I should give a shot to those schools. I had an idea that I wanted to go to medical school someday. And I thought there's no downside to trying to apply to a rich, prestigious school that has just a beautiful intellectual atmosphere, which I found to be true. I set out on that journey to apply. And I did. That's, that's really something, you know. What were the steps that you took when it came to putting together your applications? So I started uh, searching around the internet for all the possible advice I could find on mostly SAT prep and the general college admissions process. My advice that I found was given through a site called collegeconfidential.com through the forum sections, where I kind of just poured over all of the different results people have gathered from their own admissions processes and took them in, studied, learned what these schools are looking for, And from there, just started as soon as I possibly could. So by the end of junior year, I was writing mock uh, essays for my future essay that would come in the start in August. And then as soon as the the Common App released the August prompts for my mission cycle, 2013 to 2014, I started writing. And from there, I just kind of took off with that. Wow, that's great. So you, you did all this online research. You compiled all the information that you could find. What were some of the specific nuggets of information that you found to be most useful? I knew I had to start early. I guess that's the number one priority. So when August rolled around, like I said, I started writing those essays. In August, I made my common app application. I put down schools I knew I'd, I would apply to, which is I figured out what schools I was going to apply early to. I applied early to Princeton University. Regular tips such as it's not the process is a reflection on yourself. It's a time to figure out who have I been? Who am I? And applying was less about all these scores because everyone's going to have scores at the end of the day. But what really matters is just the kind of person you are where they want to, they don't want just brilliant test takers because intellect is related to test scores, but they're not directly correlated more so than they wanted future leaders and people who could express themselves. And they wanted to judge from your transcript and whatnot and your extracurricular activities list from the past four years that you could, you've done things that have been significant to your environment, to your school, to your town. And they want to say that you can carry that kind of, passion into college. And so I geared my application towards finding a niche that I thought I fit well. For me, that was a combination of music and just loving learning in general, mostly geared to the sciences. And then fitting an app, making an application that like reflected that outlook on school and my life. So could you tell us how you went about communicating that outlook in the different areas of your application, the essay, the other essays, letters of rec? How, how did you kind of weave that into the various various components of your application. Yeah. So um, I have my letter of rec from my junior year AP physics teacher and AP language teacher. Um, I gave them my list of extracurriculars. They had known me particularly well, those two teachers, because I spent a lot of time with them after class to get to, so they would know me better and just because I liked them. So I knew that they were the people that I think could best represent me in um, letters of recommendation. And in those letters, which I didn't read for the entire process until just before I graduated, they just put forth this sense of, you know, Quasi is a student who's going to make some kind of difference in whatever sphere he chooses to live in. And I think that reflects how I made my application. I 
I made, you know, in the terms of prose, lots of little flowery metaphor about, uh, for example, neuroscience, because I was an applied in many schools underneath the neuroscience major. And I made a lot of uh, little metaphors about music and how it's kind of shaped my life as something that I didn't, uh, something I didn't take in as well as I thought during high school. But when I had to reflect, like the admissions process asked for, I realized how important it was to like who I was and what I represented to my school and why when I left, people, you know, clapped and people kind of felt sad inside, which I think is proof that I meant something to them. So when I made my application, I just put a lot of emphasis on what kind of roles music has allowed me to take within my school and in leadership, you know, what kind of programs I did that wasn't just on the micro level, but on a macro level, how I affected people across the state, such as in my um, New York State Youth and Government uh, program that I did, where I was a leader in the agriculture, agricultural and health um, sector of uh, lawmaking. And, you know, I just put forth an application that showed that I really cared about learning since I was a child. My parents had started that for me from their journey from Ghana to America and raising me. And I kept that going. And I chose to gear that passion of learning, particularly towards music and how it lets me be imaginative. And I think my application showed that really well. Quasi, there's so many your powerful nuggets that you just shared with us right now. I, I really like the idea of taking that theme and making sure it comes across, you know, in everything that you're communicating to the colleges. That, that's mm-hmm. okay. I'm really, I'm really glad to hear about that. Um, in your journey you know, through high school, uh, what would you say was the pivotal moment that led you to become such a strong college applicant in the end? I think it came from the latter half of junior year, where something inside me realized that all the testing to apply for college start now. I didn't want to be a senior who's going to stress out and freak out when everything was due and I hadn't researched enough. So at that point, all the research I had done since sophomore year, sophomore summer in particular, I kind of just realized that my AP tests, my SAT subject tests, my SAT itself, I needed to crank them up. I'd taken my first SAT beginning of junior year ahead of a lot of my fellow AP kids in my high school. Um, I just knew that from where I was, I had to really push if I wanted to get to those top schools. And, you know, at my high school, usually the valedictorian would apply to a bunch of top schools and maybe get one or two, which didn't happen every year even. So I knew as my rank came around senior year and I was 11th when I applied, 7th when I graduated, I had to crank out a lot. And I knew already from my parents what school and education meant. I knew from my friend's mom, who's a Princeton alumni, like I said, what these colleges can offer. So I just knew I had to do so much more, but I had what it took. So I kind of just focused it, start, started writing, which was the biggest, I think, thing. When you have to write down the material of what you're going to use, it kind of gets you really focused. So I did all that. And then when summer came, I just, when I spent my time volunteering at a hospital, in my, my downtime, I would just research more, the final steps, what's left. What are the timelines? You know, when's everything due? And just put that all together. Awesome. You know, planning ahead is so, so key. Yeah. I'm really glad that that's, you know, a major, you know, major theme in, in what you're, when you're sharing with us here. Um, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about the college essay for a minute. Now I know that you said you, you, you made sure to weave in a lot of metaphors. You know, use some flowery language. You really communicate your themes. What was yeah. the process by which you wrote your college essay? You know, when did you start it? You know, who, if anyone, did you have review it? How many drafts did you go through? What did yeah. it look like for, you know, from the initial draft to the final draft? Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so uh, there were drafts for every single college for their supplement essays, but there was, uh, you know, the main drafts for the Common App essay that would go to every school I applied to. And for that, I would say I wrote about five and a half that I didn't finish drafts. And these were different ideas of drafts, not just one idea remodeled a bunch of times. I started with a, you know... Very typical sort of anecdote of how I went to Africa and, you know, a close family member of mine had died, unfortunately, due to a disease that I didn't know at the time. And I gave, I wanted that passion to be a reason I could work hard to become a doctor. Still my personal reason, but I didn't choose to write the essay on that. I then worked through some examples of growing up around my hometown and how it like cultured me. And I thought that wasn't strong enough. And then I kind of settled on a music. And I thought that because it meant so much, because I'd been, you know, principal violist for so long, uh, a strong member of the choir and acapella group and theater community at my school, there was no reason why I couldn't write a compelling essay 
that reflected who I am through music. So I kind of just chose that sphere because I was good at that. And, you know, I made sure my writing was uh, on point. I couldn't, you couldn't submit a bad essay. I, they was reviewed so many times by first my cousin who attended Columbia. So that was a definitely, a definite like major um, editing session that I had with her on all these drafts. Um, I talked to one of my uncles who his uh, two sons, one went to Yale, one went to UPenn. Um, so I knew his advice would be pretty critical. And it was, there was a lot of bashing at the first, but <laughs> by the time it was done, I knew I'd written worthy material. And at the end, I just had, you know, my parents to look it over. And I made sure mostly for them that my supplemental essays, which had involved kind of the process of their transition from Ghana to America, my transition as something between American and a Ghanaian and taking that in stride with education. Um, I made sure that when they looked at that essay, that they kind of knew that it was close to like the exact truth. And yeah. And obviously I had my um, English teacher look it over many times for like grammar usage and rhetoric. Uh, well, as best rhetoric as I could offer. By the time all that was done, I just put it together. My first application was to Princeton by November 1st. And after that, it became far easier to apply to the rest of my colleges. Awesome. Awesome. Now, you know, November 1st, you submit to Princeton, you know, so you obviously you had your final draft complete by that point. Mm-hmm. Tell us, you know, what, when did you start thinking about your, your college essay topic? And then when did you actually, you know, put pen to paper or put your fingers to the, to the keyboard in terms of actually writing something down? The, the common app released the essay prompts for the year, I think in mid August. And I basically wrote drafts the day of starting from there. I didn't waste any time because I knew if I wanted to apply to at least like 12 plus colleges, I'd have to start now because those supplements, supplements for, for a lot of high school seniors, uh, they don't realize they need to do until their own, their application. They think they finished the common app. I'm done. They look at, Oh, what's this supplement? Oh, this shouldn't be that hard. And they see the supplement has another essay and they freak out. So I knew ahead of time, this is information I found from that website, college confidential that I needed to start as soon as possible. So I added, all my colleges to my sub, um, to my common application starting mid August when they released their uh, supplements and looked at all of their essays, wrote all of them down in separate word docs and started. I started writing in August. I started editing in September. I started reworking what I had edited by October. And I'd say by mid October, they had gone through all those people I'd mentioned before. And they were basically ready to go. Awesome. Awesome. No, again, that theme planning ahead is so key. Now, yeah. I want to touch on something different for a second. You know, like you're planning ahead, you know, you started early, you started with the test prep process early as well, the SAT, APs and all that. A lot of our listeners out there might think, Jesus, you know, like I don't want my entire high school experience to be about applying to college and just going yeah. on to the next step. So I think, you know, maybe among certain people, they hear, you know, you planned ahead so much, you were so diligent in doing your research. And then look, you know, you got into eight, all, all eight Ivy League colleges. You know, I think, you know, one question people are going to have is, you know, what was your, what was your social life like? Like, obviously you come across right now as you, you seem like a really personable guy. You know, before speaking with you, I wasn't sure what you were going to be like. So it's clear that you're not like a, an uber nerd or something like that. So <laughs> what was your social life like? You know, like how did, how did you make time for it all? You know, what, what did you do on the weekends, you know, over the summer? You know, how, how did you, how did you, you know, keep keep yourself sane and happy. I think part of the, of the logic to start as to why I could do the, these things is because basically from the age of like six, when I could be kind of comprehensible in it, most things, uh, I re- my parents were just like, you you know, going to medical school is like a goal. It should be a goal for you. And while that can be argued as to like why that should be a goal, I internalized on my own merits why I want to become a medical doctor. And obviously a giant step to do that is to go to a a really good college where you'll get the foundations to um, do well in medical school. So in a sense, I had been geared towards college ever since I was a kid, basically, which I don't, which I think while it can have some detriments of like, Oh, I'm predestined to do, et cetera. Um, in a, another way, college is a pretty high point in many people's lives. And I can see that after just spending one year here at Yale. So I definitely think starting with that, like young logic of, I want to go to a great school. I want to go to college and do something with myself. Uh, was a start as just kind of how I think through many things. Uh, there's always a next step. And then when it comes to just like hanging out with people. So, I mean, I've had like, I was a pretty uh, big uh, thespian in high school and I did lots of music in general too. So 
my friends were mostly in that uh, social sphere. And I also was like in, you know, the honor AP track in my high school. So that's another source of my friends. And I had a really tight community of friends. Um, I had at least 30 to 40 people that I could just call like my closest uh, people, family, basically. And I would hang out with them on the weekends. Um, in high school, uh, to be perfectly honest, I didn't study so much as I just did homework and retain things pretty well. So I wasn't like slaving away and doing a whole bunch of work on a constant basis. I did my homework, uh, maybe prep for a test really quickly, and then go did it. Um, when did it. So I had plenty of time to balance. I was in, like, as I said, a lot of extracurriculars. I was on track and field for a while. I knew how to organize time. And when you organize time, you always have to leave an aspect of social there. Otherwise, you would go insane. I had a best friend who lived on my, blo- who lived on my block. We would hang out but at least three times a week, um, go running, play games, video games. Um, you know, summer, I spent a lot of time going to the beach, uh, being act- active, healthy. It was really only at night for me where when the day finally like cranked down, that I would spend like a whole lot of time doing research um, at night on this website and uh, contacting my cousins and whatnot who had like done well in college and done well to get to college as well. Where this time for research came in, I spent my day in the days in the summer having all the fun I could. And then at night when I needed to like dewind, I would just unwind. I would just sit in my room and kind of do all this research. It worked out. Nice. No, it sounds like you managed to you know, keep your life pretty well rounded and make time for the things that matter. So that's yeah. really great to hear. You know, obviously, you know, you had a lot going on between school, extracurriculars, doing research. Um, a lot of people feel like they're kind of, you know, at their wits end and, you know, have deadlines for, you know, papers and whatnot. You know, mm-hmm. Would you say there's a particular habit or something you do that is unique that most people don't do that allow you to keep it all together? You know, were you like an insane scheduler and budgeting every second or was there a tool or resource that kind of helped you manage everything? I would say maybe some pride in your ability to do well in, in, in essence, I know what I can do and what I can't do when it comes to these tests or maybe my essay writing or maybe just like having deadlines. So in response to all of those, as long as you're self-aware of what you can do, you can kind of make up of what you can't do. So like if you don't do well on essays, for example, when you write them the night before, uh, you would plan maybe like the prompt was given out three weeks ago. Okay, on week two, I'm going to like write down my intro thesis. And then on the last week, I'm going to just burn through it all as much as possible, spending the last night to do editing. That's an example, like, a uh, response to, like, I know what I can do. I can't write essays the night before. So I kind of just react to that. In terms of habit, I just constantly had a habit of, like, oh, I want to do all the SAT. I kept saying that. So then I did research for it. Uh, I did all that, all that planning and all that studying, which is a key point. Um, a, lot of people, a lot of people just kind of walk into that test in particular to, like, take it and leave and it isn't a measure of your intelligence. It's only a measure of how well you literally do on the SAT. But in response to that, you can definitely, you know, buy the, the college, um, college board SAT blue book and prep. I'd say I, when I was doing my volunteering and I had downtime in the hospital, I literally just sat and took those practice tests and then researched what I had right and wrong and logic behind them online because they, they answered that online. And went through that. I kind of learned how the test tests you in essence. And from there, kind of like kept those internalized in the back of my mind. I took the SAT total of three times, um, beginning of junior year, end of junior year, being of senior year. So I had a habit of the week before the test, I literally did one practice test every day and did the research as to why my answers were right or wrong. And that's why I went in that test. I was ready to do, sit there for three hours and to do it. So ready to write my essay prompts and everything. Um, it kind of just flowed at that point. I think when, when really when you just kind of put yourself in the mindset of what you have to do, whether you're taking the SAT or writing the, um, your college essays or, or researching your colleges themselves, so long as you get into that habit before you have to actually do it, before things are actually due, it becomes much easier to do them. No, absolutely. It comes back having that sense of purpose, that confidence in what you can do. And also what I, what I really noticed in what you said was you the idea of knowing your limits and then yeah. – planning going forward to account for them in a way like, you know, learning from your mistakes, growing from them and making sure that next time you will succeed. And it comes back to knowing your limits and starting early, knowing how long things will take you and what you are capable of and what you're not. I think being mindful of that is definitely 
so, so important. So, so thanks for sharing that. Um, I am curious, you said you took the SAT three times. Um, how did you end up doing all overall? In terms of scores. So I took the PSAT. I think it was either ninth grade winter. Or it was probably 10th grade winter. Okay. Sophomore year in high school, December PSAT. My score came in December. I'm sorry. I took it in October when it's offered. Got my results back in December. At that point, I didn't know what my score meant or anything. I asked one of my English teachers. He said, oh, this would be great for this college Tony Brook. SUNY Sony Brook that I always wanted to go to. So I was like, oh, <laughs> that's cool. Because like for the longest time, that was my goal, um, college. I thought I would, parents, my parents worked there, so they knew it was a great school for science. I'd go there. I'd do a bio major, try to do as well as possible, go to Sony Brook Medical School. That was before I kind of more concretely held the idea of the Ivy Leagues. And then when 11th grade came around, I all that research I had done, because I said, like, like I said, the research on College Confidential came the summer after 10th grade. 11th grade came. I kind of knew what the SAT meant, what it kind of worked on. Just took it. Actually, I had taken um, a Princeton review course uh, over the summer at Southern Brook University before I took that test. Uh, I didn't do a lot of prep with that. Probably my mistake. I didn't take it so seriously because I thought I had time. And just took that test. At that point, I'd done fairly well. Uh, that w- the score I'd gotten then would have gotten me to like some good liberal arts schools. Definitely my so- uh, Stony, Brook, Stony Brook idea. I didn't do well enough where I thought this is the best I could do. I spent, during the year, it was 11th grade, th- that, I thought that was like the year where your scores mattered, mattered the most kind of for college. Because that was like where you, that's the last year you're going to send your full transcript. Because senior year, you, don't, you send a mid-year report after you apply focused on school for that part. And when June came around, I wanted to take the test again, like most of my friends were this time. I had done that, like like I said, a week of just straight prep. Took that test. You know, I did like a, like a hundred point increase. So I thought, oh, this is like pretty good. Now, I can, but at this point, I'd kind of left the realm of like, my scores are going to get me into like Stony Brook and more into the score realm of like, I'm just a little bit under what it would take to actually go to those like Ivy Leagues as my friend's mom was pushing for. I thought I'm not, that far. So I then spent that summer doing that intense one test a day while volunteering um, kind of ordeal. I did sections at times, you know, three seconds in a day, a look at it, come back the next day, do another couple sections. And the next thing you knew, like over the weeks, I'd just been going through three or four tests in a month or so, um, or five even. And then when October came, you know, everyone who had waited um, knew, oh, I have to take the SAT holy crap, how am I going to do it in time? And I kind of just coasted because I knew, like, at this point, I know I can do pretty well in this test. So I'll do my last cramming, which was, again, one test a day, the week of, and then the rest of the day before, took the test on Saturday. And at that point, my score, which unfortunately was posted online, I should have thought about that more when everyone was asking me about it, did well enough to know, okay, I can definitely get in at least one of these schools. I have a chance. And then he kind of like applying to these schools. It's always a crap shot, but I thought I had an ideal kind of crap shot. So I went and applied at that point. I thought I was be, I'd be okay. And when Princeton came along, oh, I knew I was okay at that point. I probably could have stopped, but I didn't feel fully satisfied as crazy as that sounds with the school. Cause while it is objectively a wonderful school, I think it's persona didn't fit me as best as I thought when I was applying. So I did some more applications well, that's, that's awesome. I mean, it definitely sounds like, you know, the, your whole SAT prep process, you really didn't give up. You kept learning and improving and, you know, focusing on sc- you know, getting a score that you thought you would need to, to shoot for the stars and to shoot for those Ivy Leagues. So again, yeah. the persistence, the planning, the reflections and growing from that, you know, is really, really inspiring to all our listeners. You've been listening to part one of a two-part interview. So make sure you listen to part two for the rest. Thanks for listening to College Admissions Toolbox. Head over to www.collegeadmissionstoolbox.com to get more free tools and resources that will help you get into the colleges of your dreams. One of the hardest things about the college process is finding the money to pay for it all. I was only able to get the scholarships I needed after I figured out how to present myself and what I'd done in the best possible way. So now, I want to give you a free worksheet I made. It's based on my experience working with thousands of high school students. I'm sharing it with you because I really think it's going to help you turn your achievements into scholarship money.
So get your free worksheet at www.collegeadmissionstoolbox.com slash scholarship.